Hello, this is Michael Paul. It's a pleasure to be speaking before you, even electronically. Before I say anything else, I would like to apologize for not being able to be with you in person today. It seems that nasty weather caused my airlines to cancel their flights to the area. But through the magic of technology, I hope that this recorded video, finished not very long ago, will be a suitable substitute for my being with you there in person. At the start, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation on being asked to deliver this lecture and be included among the Blue Friars. I am honored and privileged. A few months ago, I was contacted by Brother Morris when he asked if I would deliver this talk. At that time, he asked if I might have a talk in mind, and we kicked around a few ideas. I was unsure of exactly which subject might seem most fitting, so we settled on my thinking about it for a while. During the time that I was giving the subject some thought, I received an email from a young Mason I've known a few years now. He is one of the up-and-coming young Masons, who is something of a more radical sort. He actually wants more from Freemasonry than a spaghetti and meatball dinner, followed only by a reading of the minutes. He wants the real deal. He wants to learn the ritual, study the philosophy, and understand the history of Freemasonry. Radical, right? I've known this brother a few years now. I've read papers that he has written and enjoyed conversations of our thoughts of Freemasonry. About a year or so ago, he asked me to speak at his lodge during his term as Worshipful Master. I was glad to do so. Some months back, this brother was himself asked to give a talk at a Masonic function. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend. But the reports I received from those who did attend said that he did a great job. So the mail I received from him was not only surprising, but gave me some cause for concern. He seemed to want to open up to me about the talk he gave. He said that prior to giving the talk, he was very nervous, as he knew that there would be a number of Masons in attendance who he truly respected. He said that their opinion of his talk meant a great deal to him. He said that at the conclusion of his talk, everyone applauded. But then he said that was it. He said that he was very disappointed because nothing else followed his talk. He told me that he expected the brothers who thought so highly of to approach him and speak with him about his talk. He said that he expected them to give him pointers or anything that he could do to improve his talk. Basically, he expected them to critique his lecture. I was surprised at this as it caught me a bit off guard. I stopped and did some thinking about various lectures, some that I've attended and some that I've given. I don't ever remember giving a lecture and having anyone come up to me with an unsolicited critique of my talk. And I've certainly never gone up to any lecturer and given unsolicited advice or pointers on how they should improve their next talk. This not only seems very inappropriate, but rather rude. I was not sure of what the young brother was thinking, and at first I thought about dismissing the conversation. I then realized that this was a very sincere young man. I knew him to be a deep thinker and not someone given to just emotional displays. I started to think a little more about what he was asking me. Whenever I'm trying to figure out a problem, I like to separate all aspects of the problem and put each aspect into its own little cubby hole so that I can study the different aspects independently of each other and without interference. In looking at this particular problem, I thought about one aspect right away. This brother is creative. He's a writer. I'm not going to make blanket statements and state that all writers or creative types are identical, but I will say that in my experience, most creative people have an insecurity deep within them. Even if they wear a mask or put on great displays of bravado, if you look hard, you can see that little glimmer of insecurity. Most writers are creative types live with this insecurity as part of their creative process. I believe that this is what makes them continue and move from project to project. While they may seem very confident in everything that they do, and speaking from personal experience, I know that late at night, before sleep comes, little gremlins come into our minds and worry us. Did we do this right? Could we have done this better? Will anyone like this? 
Do I really like this? All of these little doubts creep into our minds and torment the creative sort. This is one aspect. Another aspect is that unless anyone here has mutant powers, like a Professor X, we don't have the ability to read anyone else's mind. We know exactly what we think, but we have no clue what anyone next to us or around us is thinking. If we know someone well or are good at reading body language, then we might get general hints as to how they are feeling, if they are happy or sad, general things. But we cannot get into another's mind and know exactly what they are thinking about anything. That's the second aspect. And then there's the third aspect. How was what we are doing being received? What do they like? Do they like what we are doing? Do they care? This is a tricky one. Let me give you an example. If I write a paper and that paper is published in some journal or other publication, that paper will go out to however many people receive that publication. So let's look at this. Out of everyone who receives this publication, there will be a percentage, and I have no idea what that percentage is, but they will take the publication, look at it, and then just place it down unread. If these people who do not read the article have any opinion of it, it can't be a valid opinion. How could I pay attention to any opinion anyone has of something if they've never read it? So this group has to be discounted. Then we look at those who have quick emotional reactions to anything written. This is also a small group. In my experience, they seem to be on both ends of the spectrum. Some are very quick to praise any and everything that's written. Others very quickly point out the great flaws and criticize everything about what's been written. In my opinion, emotional responses, either positive or negative, made quickly, do not best serve us if we want an objective evaluation of our work. So what are we left with? We're left with the silent majority who give no opinion whatsoever of our work. So if the majority of the people do not comment on our work, and we do not have the ability to enter into their minds to learn exactly what they think of our work. And in addition, we have these insecurities and worry about the quality of our work. Then I can begin to see the point this young brother has. He is worried that he is either wasting his time because no one is interested in what he's doing, or that he lacks sufficient ability to properly do the work. His position and concerns are not at all unreasonable. After some thought, I told the brother that I always do my work by the rule of one. What that means is that if I do something, I try to be as objective as possible and look at my work and ask myself if I can truly see just one person benefiting or being helped in some way by my work. If the answer is yes, then I keep it. If I cannot objectively see anyone benefiting from something that I've done, then I toss it away. I tried to explain to him that since we can't get into the minds of anyone else, we need to use our own minds to objectively evaluate what we've done. But then I pointed out that there is another aspect that we need to consider, and it is the cold reality of history. Sometimes we might not ever obtain the answers we seek. Let me explain. A few years back, I gave a talk in a lodge, and there were about 35 or 40 Masons present. I wanted to do something different with this talk and wanted to learn something from them. I told them that I was going to ask them a few questions and would appreciate their answers. I first asked them if anyone has ever heard of Albert Pike, if they would raise their hand. Like a shot, every hand in the room went up. I pointed out that Albert Pike was Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council Southern Jurisdiction, and most Masons in the U.S. did know of him. I then asked them if anyone could tell me the name of the Grand Commander who followed Albert Pike. Nothing. Not a single hand went up. I was a little surprised as I was in the Louisiana Lodge, so I gave them a hint. I told them that he was the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana. Still nothing. 
I said, okay, does anyone know the Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction right before Albert Pike? Surprisingly, about a half a dozen hands went up. I thought, okay, this is interesting. I had some paper and pencils and sent them out to everyone who raised their hands. I asked them if they could write down the name of the Grand Commander just before Pike and then send it back up to me. All the papers came back and to my surprise, each and every one of them had the same name written down, Albert Mackey. I thought, how interesting. Albert Mackey was never the Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, but he did have something very much in common with Albert Pike. And I don't mean the Scottish Rite, as the Grand Commanders before and after Pike also had the Scottish Rite in common, but no one knew their names. What brothers Mackey and Pike had in common was that they were both prolific writers. They wrote and they wrote and they wrote. They were also both human beings, and they had all the doubts, insecurities, and concerns of anyone else. Yet well over a hundred years after the death of both of them, their names are still known. They have an impact even today. It was not the office that gave Albert Pike the reason why he is remembered today. It was his pen. It was his determination to write and keep doing it again and again and again. He had no more ability to see the future than anyone has today. He did not know that he would be remembered after all the years after his death. He did it because he knew that it was the right thing to do. He wrote because he was a writer. The pen is mightier than the sword. It's true. Those who are in positions of authority lead us, but it's the writers who teach the leaders, we, and I'm talking about everyone here watching this video. We are the writers, editors, communicators of today. We are the ones who are laying the foundation for the future of Freemasonry. It's an awesome responsibility. The young men who are reading what we write, what we teach, are the same ones who will one day be leading Freemasonry. If we do a poor job of it, then we can expect poor leadership in the future. If we seek titles, glory and honor, then we might just get it, but that will probably be all that we get. Time will forget us. History will forget us. If we are to do our jobs properly, then we must be unyielding, uncompromising in our integrity and our determination to not settle for anything but the best that we can offer. We owe this to the ones who read what we write. I pointed this out to the young brother, that many well-respected and beloved artists, known all over the world, lived their entire lives believing that their life was a waste and their work wholly unappreciated. I pointed out that our reward is our work. In the common understanding of fair and unfair, it may seem that we have drawn the short end of the stick, but truthfully, there is no work that I would rather be doing. Through our work, we are living the teachings of Freemasonry. That's a reward so very few receive. My brothers, I encourage you to never stop what you are doing. It is too important to the whole of Freemasonry. We need to keep writing and teaching and never stop. I believe that what we do is needed now more than we might imagine. Grand Abbot, this concludes my presentation. I am honored and privileged to be among the number of the Blue Friars. I am grateful for the opportunity to address you. Thank you all.